well, uh, students again who are here. With this time, topic on physiology of lactation. Before we start, as usual, let's all seek guidance to the righteous from the Almighty and also seek him the knowledge which is beneficial to the society and mankind. With these words, we'll be dealing today with the physiology of lactation. Being the veterinarians, we are bound to have the sound knowledge about the physiology of lactation because the domestic animals which we rear basically with this object to get meat, egg or the hides. In case of our domestic animals, the dairy cattle, we are mostly concerned with the production of milk. And that's where this lactation comes in. You know, dear students, the milk, probably which we all consume, and you know about this milk, which is a natural, perfect food, what we'll name as Lexa, or in other words, what you also term it as Abhihayat. Probably we all are very much familiar with this milk as we do consume it in our daily life. And for that matter, the India is the largest producing country in the world as far as this milk is concerned. More than 3 million tons per year are being produced by the India. And the availability of milk in India per capita is more than what's recommended. So this milk comes from our domestic animals, particularly the cattle, buffalo, and a little bit from the goat. This milk, which we name as Abhi Hayat, actually is being produced by this animal when it gives birth to a baby. So in fact, that milk is a perfect food for the baby which it has delivered. So that's why we say this is the only the food, the only source of energy and other protein and minerals. And animals do produce this for their babies. Even the humans, they do also produce milk for their babies. And you see that these babies exclusively feed on this milk. In case of babies, you'll see that they will take this for about six months before they take anything through their mouth, any solid material. Similarly, the animals also, they won't take any solid material. In case of large animals, particularly and the calves, up to one month at least, they will not take anything solid. Then after that, they will try to get something in terms of uh, grass. This is the food which actually takes care of all the development of that baby once it is born by this milk. So this is this milk is really an alexia, this is an abhihan, because it takes all those, uh, all that growth a baby 
gets from its birth. It's because of this milk. Once it takes the milk, it takes care of all the developments. It gives all those, you see, uh, materials, the energy, the proteins, the lipids, the uh, other micronutrients, minerals, vitamins, everything which the body needs for its development. So that's why we name this milk as a nature's perfect food. Not only that, it offers, it's, it's being offered by parents to the offsprings for their development. It also gives them a warmth. When the babies are suckling, or they take milk, they also get a good balance of body temperature. They get warmed out of this milk, which comes from the mother's mammary glands and which having a good temperature. And that gives baby prevention from hypothermia. Otherwise, these young ones, the young borns, or the newborns rather, their thermoregulatory mechanism is not so much matured. And in most of the cases, if we see these newborns dying, the major cause of that is hypothermia. So milk also gives the warmth and then maintains the body temperature of these newborns besides giving the nutrition, prevents the starvation. Besides this milk also provides disease resistance to the new babies in the form of ready-made antibodies. The first milk which the baby gets, what we commonly name as cholesterol, that's very rich in passive immunity, the immunoglobulins, many other proteins, minerals, vitamins. And this, once taken by the baby, they get, these immunoglobulins get absorbed from the intestinal wall and provide a passive immunity to the newborn. It is to be noted here that this cholesterol, which is high in these immunoglobulins and proteins, should be fed to the newborn immediately after the birth. Because the absorption of these proteins ceases after say six to 12 hours after birth. So before that, the animals should be fed with this colostrum so that they get directly absorbed into the blood and provides the passive immunity to the newborn. Besides, it provides the physical protection also. This is the milk, which gives a bond between mother and the new, the babies. And by that, it provides a physical protection to the new also. So this milk, is basically coming from the mother when it gives birth to the baby. And we say that mother is lactating. So mother is only lactating once it gives birth to the baby. Before that, she is not. Therefore, this lactation, when we say lactation, it is a process of synthesis and secretion of milk from the mammary glands. Now these mammary glands are basically the prime structures which produce this milk. And this process of the synthesis and secretion of that milk from these glands, which are basically the cutaneous glands, is called as lactation. This whole process of lactation, synthesis and secretion of milk, it is encompassed in 
mammogenesis, lactogenesis, and galactopoiesis. The mammogenesis is basically the development of these mammary glands, the development of these secretory glands which do produce milk. So their development, we name that as mammogenesis. Then term comes the lactogenesis that describes the synthesis of milk in the glands and in a session of milk secretion. So it is a lactogenesis, lactomilic the genesis means its formation, the synthesis. So it describes the synthesis of milk in the glands, which have been developed, which got developed through the process of mammogenesis. And now they have gained the capacity produced to synthesize milk and are able to initiate the milk secretion. So that's the process of lactogenesis. Then galactopoiesis, one more term that describes the maintenance of milk secretion through the lactation cycle. So once these mammary glands have developed to the stage that why they are able to synthesize the milk and produce the milk. Now the thing is that they have to maintain the secretion for a certain time, what we name as a lactation cycle. So that is galactopoiesis. The maintenance of that milk secretion or the maintenance of that lactation throughout the lactation cycle, we name as galactopoiesis. Coming further, that this mammogenesis This mammogenesis is basically in a female partner and this is taking place in five distinct phases. The prenatal phase, prepubertal phase, postpubertal, pregnancy and early lactation. As already discussed that mammogenesis is basically the growth of these glands which do produce milk and the growth of these glands takes place in different phases of the life itself. When a female is inside the womb, a blueprint of these glands is based, is laid down and there is some growth, initial growth in the fetus, in the embryo itself, when it is yet in the womb. So that stage we name as prenatal. So when it is within the womb, the female has those structures which give, give, will give rise to the mammary glands and their growth during that fetal life, we say that phase as a prenatal. Then after this prenatal, there comes a stage of postnatal, means when baby has given birth, the female has taken birth and now the development which will take place in the mammary glands, they will be postnatal development and in that postnatal First will be prepubertal, means the female has not yet reached to the puberty. After birth till puberty, whatsoever that development is there in the mammary glands, that is the prepubertal development of mammary glands. Or then postpubertal means once that animal has come into the puberty, it has come into the cyclicity, then this growth of the mammary glands is post-pubertal growth and then when animal gets pregnant and during this pregnancy there is a tremendous growth in these mammary glands towards the last trimester of that pregnancy and that growth in the mammary glands we name a growth during pregnancy and then growth during early lactation means when that animal has given birth to the new baby and that 
is a lactation and during that lactation, early lactation, there is again a growth in the mammary glands, which we name as early lactation. So during the fetal development, means prenatal growth, basic structures of the gland are formed and the growth is independent of hormonal influence. There is no influence of hormones for this. It's all genetically uh, drawn and the basic structures are formed. And as other structures in the body during prenatal life grow, these mammary glands also do grow. In most species, the male mammary glands has the structure similar to those of the female glands in the prenatal life. We'll find that in the males also, this, these structures are similar as that of the female gland. See, in this chart, you'll find that in case of uh, it's a bovine, we are taking example of a bovine here, over here, the mammary band which is being laid down, uh, produced, or that gets divided by day 32 of pregnancy, then that develops into a mammary streak by day 34, or a mammary line by 35, a mammary crest by 37, mammary lock by day 40. Memory bud by day 43. Then the fetal life, where there is an early teeth formation, that's day 65. Primary sprouts, day 80. Secondary sprouts, means there's a branching in these. So sprouts are being formed. They get divided, redivided, and there is a, a formation of a tree with branches. So that's primary sprout by day 80, secondary sprout by day 90, then development of cisterns by day 110. When there is a division and redivision of these sprouts and they do form a tree of, uh, I mean, uh, those ducts or the mammary gland. And between them, there is a development of a cavity or cistern that's visible at day 10 of the pregnancy. Then after the animal takes birth, before puberty, that pre-pubertal development, that's generally, again, non-hormonal. It's not being influenced by the hormones. Or rather, hormones have a very little role to play in the pre-pubertal development of mammary glands. So this growth is confined to the growth of parts of the mammary gland that are not clearly defined at birth such as vectors around the teeth, meatus, and the smooth muscle fibers. From birth to the three months, this growth is isometric. Means that the other structures in the body, as they grow, similarly, this mammary gland do also grow in the same rate. So that's an isometric growth. So DNA content parallels the growth of the other tissues in the body. Then birth to the puberty, the growth in the mammary glands, that rather outfaces, that outfaces the growth of other tissues. Means that's an allometric growth. Means this growth now in the mammary glands is much more than the growth in the other tissues of the body. So that's an allometric growth. Here, the DNA content will be greater when compared to the DNA of other tissues. And there is increased mammary cell numbers also. So this is growth up to the puberty. After puberty, the growth is almost due entirely to the hormonal influence. So once puberty has set in, the growth in the mammary glands is now being taken care by the hormones which are being produced at the time of the puberty means when the animal has come into the cycle city 
Now it's endocrines, reproductive tracts, reproductive glands, reproductive endocrine glands. They have matured enough. And now those hormones are being produced, which are reproductive, reproductive hormones. And they take care of the growth of the mammary gland after puberty. The bulk of the growth of these mammary glands, it now takes place during pregnancy and then regresses after the peak of lactation. So majority of the growth of these mammary glands, it takes place during the pregnancy. But before the pregnancy, during that puberty, once that animal starts cycling, there is a good growth in the mammary glands also. Maybe restricted to the ductal growth, but once the pregnancy sets in, there is increase in the growth of alveoli also. And this cycle repeats itself with each pregnancy and lactation period. So once there is pregnancy, there is a bulk growth and then baby gets born. There is cupious uh, secretion of milk from these mammary glands to a particular stage. Then it dries off. The whole, those structures, they get involuted. And once next pregnancy comes in, again, there is revitalization of these mammary glands. Again, where good growth in the mammary glands to prepare it for secretion of milk in next cycle. Now, during puberty, the two hormones, the estrogen and progesterone, which are being produced by the ovaries, the female reproductive organs, they take a good role in the development of these mammary glands. Estrogen particularly takes part in the ductal growth. As the Extensive growth of ducts or the branching, what earlier uh, uh, during uh, say uh, prenatal period or just postnatal, early postnatal period, those structures which have been formed there, they are branching, rebranching, and extensive rebranching into primary, secondary, tertiary branches that mostly is taken care by estrogen. Whereas progesterone takes care of these formation of alveoli from the terminal branchings of mammary ducts. And this progesterone, you see the estrogen and progesterone in a cycle, they do also uh, cycle with the astrocycle. You find in the follicular phase of this estrus cycle, the estrogen will be taking the upper part, the upper hand. Whereas during the luteal phase, progesterone will be taking the upper hand. And in most of the pregnancy, you'll find the progesterone will be on upper side. And so during pregnancy, there is a tremendous growth of this alveoli and conversion of these terminal ducts into the alveolar tissue, which is only seen during pregnancy. So there's an exponential growth during pregnancy, where besides progesterone, estrogens, placental lactogens, they take part in the growth of this mammary gland. Then comes early lactation. That's 10 days after parturition. So once animal has given birth to the baby and then there starts the production of milk which feeds to the baby, gives everything to the baby, gives that abhyaya to the baby. So these 10 days after parturation, that's what we name as early lactation, there is a tremendous development or the proliferation of these mammary secreting cells. There is increase in the DNA content, 
65% more. And in this process, one more hormone now takes lead, that's the prolactin, growth hormone and cortisol. So during early lactation, it's now the prolactin, the growth hormone, the adrenal corticoids, which take care of the mammary gland development. There is tremendous proliferation in the cells, the growth in the cells, and the secretory see, potential in these epithelial cells of the mammary glands under the influence of these hormones, the prolactin, growth hormone, and cortisol. Once the animal comes towards the end of this lactation period, what we name as declining phase of the lactation, the cell numbers decrease, there is an increased apoptosis, increased cell death, and milikil also decreases. Of course, DNA content will also decrease until it reaches the die period when it's not going to produce milk now. So gland involutes. The gland involutes. So mammary gland development we have seen in different phases of the life in a female. Similarly, this mammary gland, it is, as said already, tannous gland. And it gets developed from well after, uh, say, birth to the pregnancy and to the lactation. And it gets a good mass. Therefore, this gland is being supported by fibrous tissue, by the ligaments. But we have the most important, the lateral suspensory ligament that's composed of fibrous tissue arising from the sub-pelvic tendon, extends downwards and forwards, spreads over the external surfaces of this udder beneath the sink. So on the sides of this udder, well, we are discussing about the structures of this mammary gland, which is supporting by different uh, ligaments, the lateral and the median ligaments. And the secretory tissue of this mammary gland, which is mostly composed of these ducts, the very extensive tree of ducts, and those terminal ducts being having those alveoli, the milk secreting structures, and these alveoli. They are, many of them are being surrounded by the connective tissue to form the lobes. And many of the lobes do form the, see, lobules. Lobules, many of the lobules together form the lobe. And lobule is containing the alveoli. As we have seen, that alveoli which are being there, about uh, the producing units, about the diameter of one alveoli is 50 to 250 microns. And several of these alveoli together form a lobule, and each lobule contains some 150 to 220 alveoli. And those, these uh, alveoli, once they're surrounded by connective tissue to form the lobes, and this is what is being depicted over here. The lobes, we do have a good number of alveoli inside. This is the connective tissue. These are the inside the alveoli here. These are all those structures, sac-like structures. This, what, uh, again, you can see over here. See here, these are the secretory cells, the epithelial cells. This is the lumen, and this is the uh, 
myoepithelial cells surrounding these alveoli and these alveoli, these epithelial cells, the secretory cells, which produce milk into this, you can say, antrum, the alveolar sacs, and then these are connected together to form the lobules and then lobes, and then they do drain this milk which is being produced in the secreting cells or the alveoli or in these ducts as we have already discussed the milk in these alveoli or the ducts that's mostly 60 to 80 percent of the production whereas 40 percent is there in the cisterns the cavities one the gland cistern this is a gland cistern over here and then a teeth cistern, which is a teeth, a cistern within the teeth, that's a teeth cistern. You see, all these structures, they drain ultimately this milk, which is being produced in these alveoli, through these ducts into this cistern, the gland cistern. And then this gland cistern is in continuation with teeth cistern. And then teeth cistern opens outside through this tree canal through this tree canal. And this tree canal that's guarded by the sphincters, the sphincter muscles over here and lined by the creatin. And this is the meatus over here. These sphincter cells always this causes the closure of this teeth so that there's no infection. There is no, I mean, uh, those microbes, they are, do not take entry into the gland. So it remains always there closed until it is being relaxed at the time of the milk or milking or the suckling. This again is having over this street canal, this street canal or this uh, here, you see street canal. It is having a uh, she, uh, laminated structure, what we name as Furstenberg's rosette. Again, this Forstenberg's rosette provides resistance to the entry of microbes inside. You can see over here, this is the teeth canal. See, this is teeth canal. This is, uh, you can say, teeth cistern and teeth canal. And it's having longitudinal muscles, teeth canal linings. Teeth canal is this, and you have circular muscles, which provide this, uh, I mean, uh, the sphincter to the steed canal and gets open only when there is milking or sucking. So this is the primary structure of the mammary gland or the secretory structure of the mammary gland, which is an extensive network of these ducts, the alveoli, which drain into the cistern, first into the gland cistern and then into the teeth cistern. And then at the time of suckling or the milking, the teeth canal gets open and then allows this milk to come out. So these mammary glands, their number and location differs in various species. So this location and the number of these mammary glands you can find in the books is quite different. Mostly the primates, uh, rather uh, these, uh, what we name as primates or the mammalians, we do have these characteristics of having the mammary glands. It's because of the name that indicates the mammalia. So that class mammalia does have those mammary glands. And their location and number, uh, even this, uh, those street canals, they, they also differ between the species. And you'll find that in primitive non-extinct mammals, called as monotremes, that include the duck-billed platypus, they have no teeth. They don't have teeth or the nipples. But this milk directly is secreted through the ducts onto the abdominal fur or onto the surface of the skin. 
Where from then babies lick. So there is not, there is no any defined structure like teeth that will be uh, suckled by the newborns, but that milk simply in monotremes gets secreted from the ducts onto the surface of the body. Next in the animal evolution, we have marsupials, those possesses inguinal mammary glands covered by a pouch. In those marsupials, we have inguinal uh, mammary glands, means that inguinal glands are pushed, positioned posteriorly in an inguinal area and are covered by a pouch. And these, in case of kangaroos, they have separate mammary glands that can feed age-specific milk to two joys of different ages. In case of Etheria, means the now advanced in development, where we stand on them or animals and the humans, rather the placental animals, what we name as Etheria class, they have these mammary glands advanced, well developed, and they are situated at different places onto the surface of the body, ventrally always in the animals, well from the thoracic region to the inguinal region in many of the animals. If you see the position and number of these mammary glands in different animals, you'll find that in case of marsupials, you can see they are uh, mostly abdominal or you can say the inguinal. Whereas in case of carnivores, say cats, dogs, they are thoracic, abdominal and inguinal. Means they run from thoracic region to the inguinal region. You'll find in case of dogs and the cats, whole of that belly from thoracic to the inguinal region, they will be possessing those glands on the both sides of the midline in peers you'll find in peers so they will be total glands you'll find it eight in case of cats domestic it may be 10 in case of mouse also 10 in case of rabbit also 10 these animals do have all along the ventral line or ventral middle line on either side of this middle line they do have uh, these glands maybe thoracic abdominal and inguinal all along. Whereas then in case of the elephants, you'll find only the thoracic two. There'll be present two uh, glands as in case of the humans. You'll find in the woman two thoracic glands. That's true with the elephants also. In case of the horse, you'll find two glands but they will be the inguinal. Whereas in case of cattle, you'll find again the inguinal but they will be four glands. Uh, the uh, She uh, four two and rear two. Then, in case of sh sheep and goat, you will find only two two, but the inguinal again. Whereas in pig, you will again find that these mammary glands all all along the ventral surface of the body, on either side of this midline from thoracic to the inguinal region, with almost two well mammary glands. Whereas openings of these teeth, you'll find in case of dogs, cats, it's multiple openings at the teeth. In case of mouse, the house mouse, it's only one, but they have 10 glands, but the opening is only one. Whereas in rabbit, it is 10 to a, 8 to 10 openings. In case of whale, you'll find one opening, you'll find two inguinals. In case of whale, you have a two inguinal, whereas in elephant, you have two thoracic. See, street canals, you'll find in case of horse, two. But two openings. On a one teeth, you will have two street canals, two openings, separating, separately opening outside. Whereas in case of cattle, you will have a teeth with a one street canal and a one opening. That will be true with the sheep, that will be true with the goats. But in case of the pigs, you will again have two. Whereas in primates, 
rather in case of the humans will have a good quantity of these openings on the teeth that's 15 to 25 so this is the positioning and the number of glands and positioning of these mammary glands in different species of the animals now as far as supply of these mammary glands is concerned approximately 400 to 500 liters of blood flows through the udder for every liter of milk that's produced in case of bovines it has been calculated that for every kg of milk or for every liter of milk a cow produces some 400 to 500 liters of blood has to pass through the mammary glands rather 10 percent of cardiac output a good quantity of blood is being circulated through the mammary glands which are lactating so blood flow out to these uh, glands or the other or you can say the mammary glands that originates from the caudal aorta the right and left iliac arteries which then supply to the right and left halves of the udder. Each this iliac artery gets divided into external and the internal iliac arteries. The external iliac artery is the major artery that supplies the udder. So branching into the prepubic artery that passes through the inguinal canal and continues as external pudental artery or a mammary artery and divides into the caudal and cranial branches to supply the substance of the udder. So it is the ultimate that pubertal artery, external pubertal artery, originally arising from the iliac arteries and then uh, into the inguinal canal passing and forming the pudental artery or mam mammary uh, or mammary artery. So blood once is supplied through the arteries, it has to get returned and that blood is being returned by the veins. So this return is through collateral route through the perineal vein or a caudal mammary vein. The most prominent collateral route found in the cow and sheep and goat is torturous subcutaneous abdominal vein or amylic vein which directs blood to the heart via cranial vena cava. Animals having thoracic mammary glands, they are being supplied through internal and external thoracic arteries. And good quantity of lymph which is being produced during lactation that's more than what the milk is being produced. So that lymph, which is the part of the bullet, has to get returned into the main blood supply. And that flows through extensive network of vessels to the supramammary lymph node present in the mammary fat pad above the caudal glands, which we have seen in the diagram. If you go back to the diagram, we will find that to go back to the diagram. This is here the diagram. You find rather it's over here. Yes, this is supramammillary leaf node over here. These are the mammary, or you can say mammary veins, arteries, and the veins. And these are lymph veins which are coming through the supra lymph nodes and then into the circulation. And this is the subcutaneous abdominal vein, the major collateral vein. These are this from the substance coming all into this collateral subcutaneous abdominal vein, which is a very torturous and a very prominent in case of uh, uh, these uh, in case of cow. You will find this here again. You will. So that lymph, which is uh, these efferent vessels, leave this uh, supramammillary lymph node and passes the inguinal ring into the abdominal 
into the abdomen and then deep inguinal external iliac or prefemoral lymph nodes to the systemic circulation. Ventral branches of two, three, and four lumbar nerves form the inguinal nerve supplying the mammary gland. So the nerve supply to the mammary glands is through the vertebral branch or the rather ventral branch of two, three, and four lumbar nerves. And then inguinal nerve divides into the caudal and the cranial inguinals, supplying respective areas of second teeth and gland. The motor supply to the other is from the lumbar sympathetic plexus, and its primary activity is to induce vasoconstriction and muscular constriction of the teeth sphincters. Then uh, comes to the lactogenesis. I think we will take this uh, lecture uh, separately about the lactogenesis. We'll end over here today with this uh, first uh, lecture on lactational physiology. So I'm taking leave over here and next time we'll again assemble with one more lecture on lactogenesis.